Welcome to Tommy Solo's Famous Friends. This is where I get to chat with people that I've connected with in the arts and entertainment scene over the years. And today, I'm happy to have on the show lead singer, multi-instrumentalist, and founding original member of the band Healthfield, Mitch Field. Welcome to the show, Mitch. Hi, Tommy. Great. It's so so good to be with you this morning, and thanks for inviting me. Well, it's my pleasure. Now, I know that you've had a long career in the music business, and you recorded a couple of albums with CBS, etc., but what inspired you, and how did you get into music in the first place, Mitch? Well, I was born and raised in London, England, and when I was nine, I went to see the Beatles at the Hammersmith Theatre in London on New Year's Eve, 1963. It was the last show the Beatles did in England before coming to the States to do the Ed Sullivan show. And I was lucky enough to be in that audience and they played 22 minutes and those 22 minutes just changed my life completely. I knew that I wanted to be in the music business. I didn't know how to play an instrument, but I was hooked. And it was the Beatles that really got me into music. I started bashing on cardboard boxes and wooden boxes and eventually got a plastic drum and finally bought a set of drums. And when I was about 13, 14, 15 maybe, I left school, I joined a band, and that was the beginning of it. I just started playing with bands and clubs, and luckily I was always playing with people older than myself. I was always the kid in the band. And I got the experience of learning from professionals and how you conduct yourself, how you practice, how you do a sound check, and how you get into the business and learn the craft. Well, that's really cool. And, you know, so many of us were uh, affected by that hypnotic eye that came off the Ed Sullivan show when the Beatles went on. That, that's just crazy how many people, including myself, were influenced to get into music by the Beatles. And... Yeah, you got a a pretty early start. Now, how did you hook up and end up being the drummer in John Lee Hooker's band? Well, actually, I just got a call one day from an agent, and he said, you know, I've got a gig. Throw your drums in a cab and go to the Capitol Theater. And so I did, and as I was on my way to the show, I realized that I hadn't asked him who I'd be playing with. (laughs) And I got there, and it was B.B. King and John Lee Hooker. Wow. Of course, I'd never met Hooker and got there, set up my stuff, and waited for sound check. And Hooker didn't show up. And then we waited for rehearsal, and he didn't show up. It was about five minutes before the curtain was supposed to go up. He finally arrived, travels alone, no entourage, carries his own guitar, carries his own suitcase, came onto the stage, sat down, plugged in, didn't look at me, didn't talk to me. I had a big, big set of drums in those days, and he wasn't happy about that. And the only thing he said to me, he looked at me and he said, oh, great, another white boy. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, He said to me, he said to me, just follow my foot. But what he didn't know was I was very familiar with his material. I'd been listening to Muddy Waters and B.B. King and Howlin' Wolf and John Lee Hooker, so I actually knew quite a bit of his repertoire. And that's what I did. I just followed his foot. We did the show, and he disappeared. And I thought, well, (laughs) that was my introduction to celebrities. And just as I was packing up my stuff, I heard this voice, hey, kid. And I looked over, and it was John Lee Hooker, and he said to me, good show, kid. I'll see you at the after-show party. I never saw him again. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. And... It couldn't have been too much longer, Um, around 1970, I guess a while, 1977, you had the guts to approach Bob Gallo from CBS Records on your own and bring him your demo, and then from what I understand, they weren't totally unimpressed, but they wanted you to have a band, so how did that all work out? Basically, I bluffed my way into CBS. In those days, believe it or not, you could just actually walk right onto the lot of CBS. You can't do that today. And I said, I want to see the head of A&R. And she said, well, without an appointment, nobody sees the head of A&R. I said, okay, well, I'll just wait. So I waited all day. I came back the next day, and I waited all day, and the next day, and the next day. Because I knew at some point he'd come out of his office, 
She kept telling me he won't see you without an appointment. And so on the sixth day, I parked my car right behind his car so he couldn't back out of the lot. And when he came out at five o'clock, he couldn't move because I had him blocked in. And I said, look, I'm Mitchell. I just need five minutes of your time. He said, no, not without an appointment. I don't see anyone without an appointment. And I said, well, I'm not moving my car. And he said, okay, well, I'll give you five minutes. So we went back in. He listened to my little cassette tape and he said, yeah, okay. But we're not interested in solo performers yet. You have to put a band together. So I got the deal and then I had to go out and find a band. And I decided I would find a band that was already together and take that band. I found a band in Thunder Bay, Ontario called Denison Booth. They were quite popular. And I took most of that band and that became Hellfield. Very interesting. And then you ended up recording a couple of albums on uh, CBS with Bob Gallo producing. Yeah. Bob was my producer and the executive of CBS, Arnold Goss, which the chairman was my executive producer. So I, I had some good backing at the time. And it was really an eye-opening experience because, I, I mean, I'd done some recording before. I was a studio drummer in Nashville for a couple of years, just backing up other people. But uh, again, it's a new experience in the studio and having someone like Bob Gallo, I mean, Bob Gallo had worked with the Rascals and Benny King and many, many of Atlantic's artists he had produced or signed. And he was also a great musician, very nice guy. And he was really extremely helpful in teaching me really how you make a record. Very cool. And then I know that there were a couple of singles from the uh, debut album, um, Too Late and Tell Me Are You Listening? And yeah. you had significant FM play in Canada, but were sales actually better in the U.S.? Well, what happened was there was a station out of uh, St. Louis called KSHE, and they got a copy from Canada. It wasn't available in the States. In fact, it wasn't going to be released in the States. And once we started getting heavy rotation on KSHE and uh, some of their other stations, suddenly there was interest and CBS decided to release it in the States. And it's funny because just recently, KSHE Classics is still playing Too Long and The Pact and Tell Me Are You Listening. They have it in rotation on their KSHE Classics even today. Wow. That's pretty cool. Now... I'm curious, although you are a drummer, you've always had a drummer in the band. So was that, you just wanted to be out front? Is that what's, what was happening? Or I wanted to uh, also play drums, and I also wanted to be out front, and I also wanted to play keyboards, and I also wanted to play guitar. And uh, so I had another drummer in the band. In fact, Hellfield went through about five or six drummers for various reasons, probably because I'm a drummer. And eventually because of one thing and another. On the first album, I actually ended up doing all of the drums myself. On the second album, we had another drummer that played the parts. And on stage, sometimes we'd have two kits so I could sing up front and then I could also go and play the drums. Because what I like is, I've seen so many bands through my life, like you have, bass, drums, guitar, singer, piano. And I want to see the front man, like Don Henley, or Bruno Mars, or Phil Collins. I want to see someone who's uh, able to play the drums for a bit, and then play guitar for a bit, and then play keyboards, and then be out front. It's just more versatile. And if other people can play other instruments, for example, your drummer can play guitar, your keyboard player can play the drums, I can play the drums. It's just visually more exciting, I think. And certainly in the future, that's what I'm interested in doing. Just having a band that isn't just bass, drums, guitar, keyboard, singer. Something with a little more variety. Levon Helm, Don Henley. These are all drummers. Even Steve Perry from Journey started out as a drummer. And I just like the, uh, the variety of playing different instruments on stage. Yeah, no kidding. That certainly makes for a more versatile show. I think so. Yeah, I've known a few drummer singers, and it's crazy. You can either do everything from behind the kit or just kind of have to stay focused on the meter. I don't mm -hmm. think it really goes both ways. So I know that drummers' brains are wired a little bit differently than most of us, that's for sure. 
That's true. The difference is that when you're behind a drum singing, because you're sitting down, you can't tell the story with your arms and head and body language that you can when you're up front singing. So it's a different dynamic. When you're playing the drums and singing, you're doing five things at once. You're both feet, both hands, and singing. So you have to kind of divide your mind into four or five different places and really, really focus, like you said, on, on keeping the beat. And then when you're up front, it's a different dynamic because you can move around the stage, you can express the song and portray the song with your body language a little differently. So it's a real different dynamic, but I've always been singing behind the drums and I never found it any problem to do both at the same time. It just came very naturally to me. Wow, yeah. So that's pretty awesome. Now, uh, there was a second album, Night Music, that was released in 79. Now, what happened with that album? Well, Night Music, we had a couple of singles off of. And then just as we were about to tour that album, we were doing the Midwest. There was a lot of interest in Texas at the time, California. And just around that time, CBS was acquired by Sony. And it was the beginning of the corporatization of the record business, really. Because if you think back, we had a lot of independent labels, Atlantic, Motown, and they all disappeared. And suddenly the corporations came in and took over. And once Sony came in, everything changed. The first thing they did was cut a lot of acts from the label. And that was pretty much the end of any support we had from CBS at that point. There was a change in mentality. Um, I remember at the time that Ringo was signed to Epic to CBS. They dropped him too. Wow. So it was a complete house cleaning. They, they got rid of Bob Gallo. They got rid of uh, Arno Gossowicz, who was the, the head of CBS in Canada. And that was pretty much the end of that. Oh boy. Yeah, it's, it's uh, interesting, you know, that when the suits get involved, things kind of go sideways. I remember uh, Frank Zappa was kind of bemoaning that happening. You know, he talked about how in the early days you had mostly young guys who were innovative and creative and were interested in trying different things. And all of a sudden the guys in suits came in and they just started cookie cutting everything. Yeah, they, they were bean counters. Yeah, no kidding. And I understand bottom line economics because the music business is a business after all. But as you say, in the old days, quote unquote, people in the A&R department were usually ex-musicians. They had some contact to performing and going on the road and recording and writing. They were familiar with the lifestyle. And once the suits came in, as you say, it were people that had never played an instrument. They were executives and they were really not connected to music in any way other than, you know, how many units did you ship? And of course, when a new boss comes in, they have their own projects, which get priority. And bands that were signed prior to them get less interest, if any. And it was just part of the business. And of course, back then, there was no internet, there was no CD Baby and Garage Band and technology. You were dependent on record companies to get your music on the radio. Well, today, that business model has collapsed. And really, the reason that you signed with a record company in those days was because it was the only way to get on the radio. But most importantly, the record company was really the bank. They would front you the money, they would put you in a studio, and they would have a producer, and you'd do pre-production and rehearsal, and you'd lay down the record. But of course, every penny that was spent, you owed back. Right. Nothing is free. So if you go in and do a recording session, and the producer says, well, I think we want congas or tubular bells on this track, Suddenly, the tubular bells show up, but of course, it's all added to the bill. You owe everything, <laughs> which is why most bands never make any money at all, even if they have a hit record, because at that point, the record company has probably tried to acquire most of your writing royalties and publishing royalties, which is where the money is or used to be. And so it's not unusual at all for bands to have hit records and be making 500 bucks a week on salary. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, did you see the Tom Petty story? Uh, I think it's a documentary. It's about three hours long, called Running on a Dream. And Tom mm -hmm. Petty was the first top-shelf artist to kind of win with the record yep. companies because they, 
he was naive. He didn't know what the publishing was. He just thought that was, you know, they sell books with my songs in them or whatever. Yeah. So when he found out what had happened, he basically, as they were recording his breakthrough album, he had his guys take the tapes every night and he said, and don't tell me where they are because I don't want to, you know, if I'm put on the stand, I don't want to actually know and have to perjure myself. Right. So he hid the tapes every night and basically refused to let the record companies. He declared bankruptcy. Yep. And so finally, because he was Tom Petty, the record company said, okay, you know what? We're going to give you your own label and here's your publishing. But before that, nobody really had much of a chance against the guys in suits. Well, I was quite lucky because I was aware of the publishing and the royalties and the various streams of revenue. As you say, uh, your songs in a songbook, that's publishing, it's on the radio, it's on a jukebox. And I was quite familiar with royalties and the mechanicals. And so when I went in, they said to me, well, you know, we want 100% of your publishing and we want 100% of your writer's royalties. And I told them no. No. And they said to me, well, you know, we've got people lined up outside the door that want to sign that deal. And I said, well, invite them in because I'm not doing that. And they told me, well, you know, you're in, you're in no position, really. You're, you're nobody. We're CBS. So eventually I got them to agree to 50% and 50%. So unlike a lot of young starting out artists, I was quite lucky I got to retain a fair amount of my royalties. That was a smart move on your part. I guess sometimes it does pay to hold out. Now, I know that after all the changes at CBS and they shuffled things around and there wasn't a whole lot of support for the second album, but you eventually recorded a solo album, Grown Men Crying, that was released in 2000. Was that independent? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I wrote it and played all the instruments. I produced it. I recorded it in Montreal. Yeah, it was completely independent. I had a bunch of songs that that I'd been kind of woodshedding over the years and working on. I didn't have a band. And I just went in and just did it myself. I released it on CD Baby. And uh, it was quite successful, actually. Cool. I want to go back for a minute to the time with CBS. I understand there was uh, some conflicts between the record company and management. Was it management that wanted you guys to keep playing the bars and the record company that wanted you to play lower paying higher profile gigs yeah there was a there was a conflict uh, it's not unusual in canada to have management agents uh, those types of people around and they have a very narrow focus tunnel vision if you will so you can play sudbury and north bay and thunder bay and wawa and kappa casing and and that's okay but after you've done that circuit four or five times and you have a record that's starting to happen in the states just made more sense to the label and to myself that we'd be breaking new ground and exposing the act in bigger markets. And management was not into it. They didn't want to lose control, basically. So at some point, CBS came to me and said, look, we've got a manager in the States that we want you to go with. Your guy in Canada can handle all the Canada stuff, but we've got a big name that can take you to the next step. And my management was quite resistant to it. And eventually, I just fired my management in Canada. Okay. And I started managing the band myself and booking the band myself because I had acquired enough business sense. I knew all the agents. I knew all the clubs. And so I started booking the band myself, which caused some resistance from agents, obviously. But I decided that I could represent the band better than anyone else. Grabbing the bull by the horns. Yeah. yeah. So... What happened with Bullseye Records? Bullseye Records is a great company out of Toronto, and they do compilations of various Canadian music, and I was approached. We had a song that was recorded by Hellfield that was never released. After the second album, we went back into the studio ourselves, and we financed the recording of a third album, which was unreleased. And Bullseye had heard one of the tracks and approached me and said, we'd like to put this on a CD with other Canadian bands like the Guess Who and people like that. And I said, sure, great. And they did. And uh, it was called When CanCon Rocked was the name of the CD. And they included this unreleased track on with the show. 
cool. Yeah, it's interesting how the business goes. I actually know Jamie Vernon, and I was uh, slated to be on the unsigned, sealed, and delivered 10 record. And I'd already signed the distribution deal with Jamie and sent him a mastered copy of the one tune. And then the bottom fell out. He had no money. But that's not uncommon anymore. It's not uncommon. I I think if you go back way, way back, I think when Hart signed their first deal to Mushroom Records in Canada, same thing happened. The label collapsed. Right, yeah. And and once the label collapses, the masters disappear, and they basically close shop, and, and that's the end of the story. It's heartbreaking at first, but it's part of the business. It's just simply part of the business. Absolutely, yep. I know I've personally, I've been corporately downsized, so it's not much different. So what's happening these days, Mitch? Well, right now we're in the process of recording a new album. Myself, James Larson, who was the original bass player, and Paul Royce on guitar, who was the final guitarist in the Hellfield lineup. And the three of us are writing and uh, with technology, you know, sending each other bits and pieces and we're working on, obviously, new songs. We're rearranging some of the old songs from the third album that were never released. And we're looking at some stuff from the first two albums. And we have about six or seven songs completed. We're still tinkering with them. And we had hoped to tour. And possibly, we'll tour next year. Cool, cool. So... Do you have an ETA for a release on the new material? Well, you know, the way that we decided to approach this, the three of us, was we decided that we would take this time to take our time to create and record these new songs. So obviously we're using the technology, which is helpful, but we're also trying to let the songs breathe and be ambient and heavy. If you recall Bad Company's first album, for example, basic tracks, very few overdubs, just vocals, guitar solos, maybe percussion, and minimal tracks. You know, in the day of digital now, you can, you've got so many tracks and so many buttons and so many effects, you can spend years in the studio. But Hellfield, we never approach recording that way. We lay down the basic tracks, do the overdubs, And leave it for the most part. Uh, And same with singing. If uh, Hellfield, we never did multiple takes for the vocals. I don't. Because once you've sung it once and then you've sung it twice. And by the time you're at the third or the fourth take, you're not in the same headspace as you were in the first take. You're thinking. The producer might have said, well, emphasize this word or try this there. So by the third or fourth take, I'm not in the same place mentally and If I don't get it in two or three takes, we just move on to the next song and we come back to it. Because I'm not looking for perfection. I'm looking for rock and roll, which is imperfect. So sometimes if the voice breaks or the note is a little sharp or flat, in the context of the song, if the emotion is real, I'll go with that. Right. And that's uh, an attitude shared by a lot of people like Roger Daltrey feels the same way. Exactly. The Who recorded that way. Deep Purple recorded that way. Bad Company recorded that way. In other words, you know, I don't want to sound live like I do on record. I want to sound on record like I do live. Big difference. Big, big difference. I have no interest in replicating the album note for note live. That's not interesting to me. Uh, There's a little room in each song to play. And when you're doing a live version, you have a little more leeway, if you will. You can make it longer. You can add another guitar solo. You can just change things around a bit. And that keeps it interesting for the band and for the audience. Because when the audience hears a song on the radio, that's the version they know. They don't know that you've done one, two, three, or four other takes. Or maybe you've even patched the thing together from different takes. They only have one point of reference, and it's, that one version of the song they heard. So when you go see the band live, some people want to hear it exactly note for note. But you know, even the Beatles didn't play their songs note for note when they played them live. Sometimes you, you know, you throw in a lick or something will change or you won't sing it exactly the same way. It'll be close, but 
I don't want to replicate what was on the record. I, I don't have an interest in that. That was just one version. And you can even take the song and completely rearrange it, which is what Springsteen does, for example. Here's the song in a different package. Now, speaking about the music, where can people go to get your music? Is there somewhere that we can get your music and you actually get paid for it? At the moment, no. At the moment, we've made a conscious effort. We haven't released anything. We're not putting anything out at all. We're using a kind of unique recording process that we're experimenting with, and I don't want to get into it, but for the moment, we've put nothing out. We're putting nothing out. We're just kind of intently working on crafting and creating these new songs, and when we feel it's ready, and then we'll certainly distribute it, and it will be available, and perhaps we'll even make some money on it. Okay. What about back catalog? Back catalog, well, you can find everything pretty much on YouTube. It's amazing. I... You know, I've very recently come to social media. I was consciously not involved in social media at all for the last 10 years. Not interested, just not interested for various reasons. In the last six months or so, I've slowly made a presence on social media because I only want to go on social media when I have something to say. I think it's better to be uh, kind of... Less often, if you're there all the time, every minute of every day, then the message gets lost. To me, when I've got something to say, then I'll go on social media. So I've kind of been dipping my toe in lately and using it to some degree. And when the time is right, obviously, it'll be available. If you want to hear Hellfield, just go to, the, go to Google, type in Hellfield. It's amazing because I found hundreds and hundreds of sites and references, and I found Pictures I've never seen before, promotional pictures from CBS, and I found articles and interviews, and it's quite an eye-opener for me. Yeah, no kidding. I was really taken aback when I started Googling some of my stuff and finding finding me on Amazon, and I'm thinking, um, I'm not getting any checks from Amazon, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's pretty weird. You know, I, I don't really think I have any more questions for you, Mitch, but what I like to do on the show is to give my guests the last word. So this is your chance. If you have something that you really feel passionately about, let's have it. Well, you know, one thing is right now, it's very, very difficult to be a musician or a roadie or a sound man or a light man. It's very, very difficult, as everyone knows right now. There's not a lot of money to be made in royalties anymore. There's no live gate. You can't sell tickets right now. You're selling less merchandise, if any. So it's really, really difficult to be a musician right now. But I believe that live music will be back in some form because it touches us, it moves us, and it tells us that we have the capacity to be happy and to live in peace. And I would also say that I do need to mention the legendary Rick Lamb, who was my co-writer and my good friend. He played keyboards and guitar and sang for Hellfield. Sadly, Rick passed away. And Rick, of course, before Hellfield, was in a great band called Foot and Cold Water. And after Hellfield, he was in another really amazing band called Cinema Face. And of course, I think of Rick quite often. And also Dave Hovey, who was the original guitarist and vocalist with Hellfield. I want to give a shout out to Dave. And we've just got to be positive and we've got to go on. And one day, we'll be able to play music together, and Hellfield will go on, and like the Phoenix, we'll rise from the ashes, and we'll be stronger and more determined than ever to rock you. Awesome. Well, I'm sorry to hear uh, about your loss. Um, there's you. not, never any words that are appropriate. That said, you know, I agree that once the world turns back on, people are going to have a newfound appreciation for the music, and I just can't wait to see that happen. You know, it's great talking to you, Mitch, and um, I'm looking forward to a day when guys like you and I can get together and have a coffee or a beer and tell a few lies face-to-face, what have you. But until such a time, I thank you for being on the show, and cheers. My pleasure. Thank you so much. How about that? Mitch Field is one of those few artists who not only sings and writes songs, but if necessary, can play most of the instruments in studio by himself, and that's really cool. Now, without further ado, here is one of Hellfield's early hits. This is called Too Long. Enjoy. Got it. 
Tommy Solo's Famous Friends is a one-man production, meaning that I've done all the work, including producing, editing, guest acquisition, etc. All rights reserved. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The theme song for Tommy Solo's Famous Friends was written and recorded by Tommy Solo with a little help from my friends in the night crew. And hey, if you like the show, why not subscribe? Until next time, cheers.